CBS Sports, Major League Baseball's 63rd All-Star Game. It's a perfectly beautiful day, a wonderful crowd, and my only regret is that you can't all be here with me in my box and see the ball game. Well, no matter where you are, you've probably had dreams, and tonight, let's talk about the dreams of children, ordinary kids, down-the-street kids, like that kid with the big left arm, and oh, how those neighborhood kids could hit them. The kids who were chosen first on those lazy days in the park. Let's call them the Goosebump Kids, because as it happens, these dreams came true. Swung on a high drive. Left field. It's going deep. Newson at the wall. Gone. Home run, McGuire. Kirby, can he get there? Yes. Puckett runs it down. There's a run. Way back. It might be out of here. And there's a home run. Did he ever cream that one? Swung and there's a drive. Deep left field. Back goes Duncan. It's out of here. Braves win. Braves win. A two-run homer for Pendleton. Through the years, we've gone from flannels to polyester and a uh, few changes in between. But don't ever lose sight of one thing. Since Babe Ruth stepped up to bat in the first All-Star game, the best in baseball have given us Midsummer's Night Magic. William swings there. And so this year's Goosebump Kids have settled in to play out the dream. Young man, you are an all-star. In a perfect Pacific setting, the best of the boys of summer will be playing baseball here tonight at beautiful San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium. We here would like to think of this as our uh, little convention. And so come on in and enjoy a beautiful Southern California setting. The starting lineups, of course, were democratically elected by the fans. And the managers filled in the remaining spots, ever mindful of the mandate to include at least one representative from each team. You know, the All-Star Game is a special event, not only for the fans, but also for the players especially the 24 first-time All-Stars, such as Biff Roberts of Cincinnati. This girl's going to make you jump. We're going to have fun here at the Bird today. Showtime. And we all hope to have a little fun tonight and hopefully a little showtime. Hi again, everybody. I'm Pat O'Brien. Welcome to CBS Sports' coverage of the 63rd Major League Baseball All-Star Game. You know, Ryan Sandberg told me yesterday, this is where lasting friendships are made, and tonight... We hope that some of these newfound friends will also create a few lasting memories. Well, a short time ago, All-Star managers Tom Kelly and Bobby Cox were in their respective clubhouses to deliver tonight's keynote addresses. We'll start off, uh, Robbie Alomar start off the game hitting first, probably hit a single or a double and steal third, and Wade will get him in. Then Puckett will bunt for a hit, and Joe Carter will drive him around first and third. McGuire can hit something somewhere, sacrifice fly or whatever. Then uh, Mr. Ripken Jr. can pick up some of those pieces in case Mr. Glavin's still in the game. Griffey will probably have a hard time with him. But then we got Sandy on the backside to pick him up, okay? Just like to congratulate everybody on this team, and I know it's an honor for you, and it's especially an honor for me to be a part of it, and our coaching staff. And I'll do the best, and our coaches will do the best we can to get everybody in a game. One thing, you know, they always preach winning and this and that, and as you know, Bill White is retiring after this year out of the um, National League presidency, and Bill has never won one of these games, and Willie Mays in here knows what a great competitor Bill was, and he's talked to me the last two days. He definitely wants to win, just like we do, okay? I think I might have introduced Willie Mays, although the National League uh, leads the series 37 to 24 with one tie. The American League has won the last four All-Star games. We're going to take a look at Mike Sharperson of the Dodgers. 
He tried to get his 71-year-old father to come to the game from Orangeburg, South Carolina, but daddy doesn't fly. And so his son will talk to his dad from the game on a portable phone and tell him the sights and the sounds. Well, that's one highlight for Mike Sharperson. Everybody here yesterday, uh, the highlight was Mark McGuire's performance in the home run derby. At one point, folks, McGuire blasted eight dingers in a row. And these just weren't over the fence. His teammates wanted to carry him off on a Sudan chair. <laughs> At one point, Joe Carter came up, thought he was getting a little tired, and so he put some water on him and uh, gave him a little pat on that arm, that big arm, and he went back out there and said, go get another one. McGuire repressed, hit number 12. He ties Cal Ripken Jr.'s record. The Bass brother uh, still thinking about it today. He talked to Jim Cott. It was a great reaction. Uh, I was shocked just because I'm pretty bad at uh, hitting home runs in BP. I'm not, I'm not the best uh, at doing that. And it's tough because usually the guy that's throwing the ball isn't throwing that hard. And uh, yesterday he was throwing real good. He found a spot right where I was swinging and uh, I hit 12 out. Let me tell you something. If you were there, that is one lasting memory. As you look around tonight, though, try to imagine what it must have been like back in the 30s when there were two All-Star games, one for whites, and one for blacks. When we come back, we'll show you some Hall of Famers who should have been playing alongside the Babe and the Iron Horse, but couldn't. That story more as our coverage of the 63rd All-Star Game rolls on from California's oldest city, right here on CBS. A picture postcard from CBS Sports to you, San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium, where soon they'll be playing Major League Baseball's All-Star Game. Our next story is about the best ball players who never made it into the Major League All-Star Game. Players such as Cool Papa Bell, who was so quick, they say, he could flick the light switch and get into bed before the room got dark. Recently, I uh, caught up with some of the Negro League greats, ball players who were victims of a terrible circumstance, baseball's color line. One day, we were sitting in the stands in South America, and the president of down there, he says, why can't you play in the big league? You can play here. I said, you'll have to ask the two grand dragons of the crew clerks. <laughs> he said, who are those? I said, they ain't who win your Atlantis. He said, you are so right. Everybody did just hate the blast. The guys used to tell us, it's a shame you guys couldn't play in the big leagues. It's a shame you couldn't play with this team and that team. You guys are good. We were major league ball players. We were at the top. And there they were, nameless faces, faceless names, playing America's national pastime as well as any all-star. They were the Negro superstars, and it was indeed a league of their own. Big leaguers, every one of them, but the big league door said no colored allowed. Rube Foster, he founded the Negro National League. His vision back in the tour game and the tabloids from all across the country called it the greatest colored sporting event of every year. And you know what? Decades later, you can still hear the echoes. And I walked out of the dugout and looked up and... Pat O'Brien and company to welcome you back to San Diego. And as we draw closer to this Midsummer's Night Dream game, it's time now to meet the All-Stars. And at the public address microphone is Bruce Binkowski. And now, the American League All-Stars. The trainers from the New York Yankees, Eugene Monahan, And from the California Angels, Ned Berger. The batting practice staff from the Minnesota Twins. In the bullpen, Dick Such. Wayne Terwilliger. And in the bullpen, Rick Stelmazek. The coaches from the Kansas City Royals, Hal McRae. And from the New York Yankees, Buck Showalter. And now the players for the American League. From the Baltimore Orioles, outfielder Brady Anderson. And the pitcher, Mike Messina. From the Boston Red Sox, pitcher Roger Clemens. From the California Angels, pitcher Mark Langston.
from the Chicago White Sox, third baseman Robin Ventura. And a pitcher, Jack McDowell. From the Cleveland Indians, infielder Carlos Bayerga. And a pitcher, Charles Nagy. From the Detroit Tigers, infielder Travis Freiman. From the Kansas City Royals, a pitcher, Jeff Montgomery. From the Milwaukee Brewers, infielder Paul Molitor. From the Minnesota Twins, infielder Chuck Knobloch. And a pitcher, Rick Aguilera. From the New York Yankees, outfielder Roberto Kelly. From the Oakland Athletics, pitcher Dennis Eckersley. From the Seattle Mariners, infielder Edgar Martinez. From the Texas Rangers, catcher Ivan Rodriguez. And outfielder Ruben Sierra. From the Toronto Blue Jays, pitcher Juan Guzman. And now, the American League starting lineup. First, the manager from the Minnesota Twins, Tom Kelly. Leading off from the Toronto Blue Jays, second baseman, Roberto Alomar. Batting second from the Boston Red Sox, third baseman, Wade Boggs. Hitting third from the Minnesota Twins, left fielder, Kirby Puckett. Batting fourth from the Toronto Blue Jays, right fielder, Joe Carter. Hitting fifth from the Oakland Athletics, first baseman, Mark McGuire. Batting sixth from the Baltimore Orioles, a shortstop, Cal Ripken, Jr. Batting seventh from the Seattle Mariners, center fielder, Ken Griffey, Jr. Hitting eighth from the Cleveland Indians, catcher, Sandy Alabar. And warming up in the bullpen from the Texas Rangers, tonight's starting pitcher, Kevin Brown. And now, the National League All-Stars. First, the Traders from the Los Angeles Dodgers, Bill Bueller. And from the San Diego Padres, Bob Day. The batting practice staff from the Atlanta Braves, Jimmy Williams. Clarence Jones. And in the bullpen, Leo Mazzoni.
the coaches from the San Francisco Giants, Roger Craig. From the St. Louis Cardinals, Joe Torrey. And now the players from the National League, from the Atlanta Braves, outfielder Ron Gant. And the pitcher, John Smoltz. From the Chicago Cubs, pitcher Greg Maddox. From the Cincinnati Reds, outfielder Biff Roberts. And the pitcher, Norm Charlton. From the Houston Astros, infielder Craig Vigio. And pitcher Doug Jones. From the Los Angeles Dodgers, infielder Mike Sharperson. From the Montreal Expos, pitcher Dennis Martinez. And outfielder Larry Walker. From the New York Mets, pitcher David Cohn. From the Philadelphia Phillies, catcher Darren Dalton. And the first baseman, John Crutt. From the St. Louis Cardinals, catcher Tom Pagnozzi. Pitcher Bob Tewksbury. And pitcher Lee Smith. From the San Diego Padres. Infielder Tony Fernandez. And infielder, Gary Sheffield. From the San Francisco Giants, first baseman, Will Clark. And now, the National League's starting lineup. First, the manager of the National League from the Atlanta Braves, Bobby Cox. Leading off from the St. Louis Cardinals, shortstop, Ozzie Smith. Batting second, from the San Diego Padres, right fielder, Tony Gwynn. <laughs> Hitting third from the Pittsburgh Pirates, left fielder, Barry Bonds. Batting fourth from the San Diego Padres, first baseman, Fred Madrid.
Batting fifth from the Atlanta Braves, third baseman Terry Pendleton. Batting six from the Pittsburgh Pirates, the center fielder Andy Van Slyke. Getting seventh from the Chicago Cubs, second baseman Ryan Sandberg. Batting eighth from the San Diego Padres, catcher Benito Santiago. Warming up in the bullpen, tonight's starting pitcher from the Atlanta Braves, Tom Glavin. And now, to honor the two great nations in which Major League Baseball is played, please rise and welcome... ...coverage of the 63rd Major League Baseball All-Star Game will continue after a message from your local station. ...to San Diego's Jack Murphy Stadium. They're about to throw out the ceremonial first pitch. Baseball's last 400 hitter, Hall of Famer Ted Williams, will be out here shortly. Right now, you're looking at the honorary man managers, Jimmy Reese who is a conditioning coach for the Angels, and, of course, the great Willie May standing there looking on as the ceremonial part of our All-Star game gets underway. There's Jimmy chewing on, I suppose, some bubble gum, and Willie Mays looking on there. That's all you need, Sam. Just stay here. Let's uh, listen in now to the PA announcer, Bruce Binkowski, as they bring out Ted Williams, and he'll get some round of applause, folks. Ted Williams, Ted Williams warming up that right arm there. He is a San Diego native and has had a great week here. They've named a highway after him. And uh, there's a familiar face, the president of the United States, George Bush. An avid baseball fan. There we go. I think he got it over the plate. It doesn't matter, folks. He is Ted Williams and the former baseball star from Yale. A nice moment. I suppose it's appropriate here in San Diego to turn the proceedings over now to a pair of Big Macs. Tim McCarver and Sean McCona. Gentlemen, have a good one. Thank you very much, Pat, and good evening, everybody. What a nice moment that was, not only for Ted Williams, but that was his son, John Henry, alongside. Tim, they say that good pitching will always beat good hitting, and certainly in recent All-Star Game history, that has been the case. Over the last eight years, there's been a total of only 37 runs scored. Should we look for another pitcher's game here tonight? I think all things point to another low-scoring All-Star game. What with the winningest pitchers in baseball going against one another, Tommy Glavin and Kevin Brown. The last time that happened back in 1971, however, Doc Ellis pitched for the National League against Vida Blue for the American League, and there were six home runs hit and ten runs scored. Of course, it's twilight time, but there's no sun out, and I think that's going to help the hitters a lot. So perhaps some unexpected fireworks here in San Diego tonight as the American League is looking for its fifth straight win. It would be the American League's longest all-star game winning streak ever. And how bad has it been for the NL in recent years? Not a single member of this year's National League squad has ever knocked in a run in all-star game competition. The first pitch after this. You know he's going to be going with his best. He'll be bringing some heat. Chalk up another K for Rob Dibble. Pinnacle by score. Craftsman hot buys mean red hot. Welcome back to San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium, site of the 63rd Major League Baseball All-Star Game. And for the second straight year, it's left-hander Tom Glavin of the Atlanta Braves to start for the National League. 
Tom Glavin with the winningest record in the National League, 13 wins. Kevin Brown, his opponent, with 14 wins. You can look for the fastball inside and outside to right-handers, a devastating changeup, and his breaking ball is his third best pitch. Backing up Tom Glavin, glittered with gold. 37 gold gloves on the defense tonight. Barry Bonds in left field. Andy Van Slyke with three straight gold gloves in center. Tony Gwynn will be the right fielder. Terry Pendleton's first all-star game at third base. Ozzie Smith will be the shortstop. Ryan Sandberg at second base. San Diego's own Fred McGriff at first. Benito Santiago behind the plate. Tom Glavin, the first senior circuit pitcher to start in back-to-back -back years since Robin Roberts 37 years ago. He said in 1992 he was out to prove that 1991 and his Cy Young Award was no fluke. And he's made that point very clearly. Tom Glavin is again his league's best pitcher. And with his first pitch of this 1992 All-Star game, he truly has achieved stardom. We're underway. Roberto Alomar with a swing and a miss for strike one. Alomar at 323, six homers, 45 driven in. He'll be followed by Wade Boggs and Kirby Puckett. It's quickly 0-2. The umpires with the honor of working this game. Doug Harvey of the National League behind the plate. Rich Garcia at first. Harry Wendelstead at second. Greg Kosk at third. Tom Hallion along the left field line and Tim Sheeta in right. Over. On the ground to second. Brian Sandberg to Fred McGriff for the first out of the 1992 All-Star Game. We mentioned it in the opening. Fortunately, no shadows with which to contend by the hitters. So the hitters are very, very happy. It is an overcast evening here in San Diego. Much easier to see. Wade Boggs enduring the worst of his 10 seasons in Major League Baseball. He's never hit below 300 in the Major Leagues. He's at 263 at the moment. Tom Glavin has yet to throw Wade Boggs an all-star strike. Last year, he faced his idol, Wade Boggs, and walked him on four pitches in the all-star game at Toronto. Glavin grew up admiring Wade Boggs in suburban Boston. He's from Bill Ricca, Massachusetts, and he said yesterday, I should at least be able to throw him one strike <laughs> this time, but he hasn't yet. It's 2-0. Wade Boggs, his seventh consecutive start. And that is the all-time record for American League third baseman. A lot of those out here in Southern California. Ready to go after the beach ball delay, and Boggs sends it straight back. Finally, Tom Glavin has thrown Wade Boggs a strike in all-star competition. Boggs usually rises to the occasion in this spotlight. He's hoping this All-Star game will serve as a springboard for the second half of the year. That's a foul ball. Two balls and two strikes. One out. The bases are empty in the top of the first. Tommy Glavin, the 11th National League pitcher to start two consecutive years. Our Major League pitcher, you mentioned Robin Roberts back in 50. Three, four, and five earlier. The last time an American League pitcher did it, Dave Steve did it back in 1983 and 84. The 2 2. Breaking ball fouled straight back. Wade Boggs has never struck out in all star competition in 19 plate appearances. Only Charlie Geringer, Red Shane Deinst, and Ron Santo have had more All-Star plate appearances without ever striking out. Up the middle, a base hit. Wade Boggs, the game's first base runner. With Wade Boggs at first, we get our first look at base cam. We have a camera inside the first base bag that will give you a unique view of the runners as they take their leads. You 
might know that one of the slower runners on either side will be leading off. Not much of a chance for Wade Boggs to be running. Only one stolen base this year. Kirby Puckett sends the first pitch out of play. So much for childhood idols, by the way. That's right. Wade Boggs, as Sean mentioned, the childhood idol of uh, Tommy Glavin, and he rips one back through the box right off the glove of Glavin. Puckett with a little pop-up in shallow center. Late start for Van Slyke, and it falls in. So perhaps the hitters won't be the only ones affected by the twilight at game time as Andy Van Slyke, a gold glove outfielder, got a very late jump on that looping single in the center for Kirby Puckett. Van Slyke's first step was back, and then by the time he broke in, Kirby Puckett, who had hit the ball off the end of the bat, Van Slyke had no chance for it. So I guess it would probably affect the fielders more than it would the hitters. Four straight gold gloves for Andy Van Slyke. Joe Carter, a late entry into the starting lineup. He got the starting nod against Tom Glavin when Jose Canseco had to be scratched with a shoulder injury. <laughs> Fouled back to the screen. Wasn't it wonderful to hear the great hands during the introductions, Tim, not only for the five current San Diego Padres, but for the six former Padres, including Joe Carter. I think the six ex-Padres and Bip Roberts started it all. Bip uh, now with Cincinnati. I think uh, theirs were at least as loud as the current Padres. A lot of Padres here tonight. Base hit for Carter. Boggs is a slow runner, but he's being waved in and then stopped at the last moment by Buck Showalter. And it's a good thing for the American League that Boggs was stopped. And the bases are loaded for the American League with nobody out. Three straight singles by Boggs, Puckett, and now Carter. Wade Boggs being held at third base by Buck Showalter. Boggs, we mentioned, is not a fast runner. Look at Fred McGriff right there. Kirby Puckett too far off of second base. And had McGriff caught the ball, he throws behind Puckett. And I think Kirby would have been an out at second base. Base is loaded and one out for Mark McGuire. He leads the majors with 28 home runs. That one nearly sailed to the backstop, saved by Santiago. Tom Glavin's only difficulty in recent years has been in the first inning. If he can get through the first inning unscathed, quite often he'll work a shutout. That's outside. He's nibbling with McGuire, and it's 2-0. and all. There should be a yellow light and a catcher's mitt in situations like this. Very, very dangerous situation. Two balls, no strikes. Glavin has to throw a strike, and McGuire with 12 home runs yesterday in the home run hitting contest. Joe Glavin was watching that. There's the fourth straight base hit. Boggs has scored. Puckett waved around. Van Slyke's throw, not in time. And the American League has a 2-0 lead. Kirby Puckett came awfully close to missing third base. That was a fine throw by Van Slyke. The fourth straight hit. All have been up the middle, by the way, off of Tommy Glavin. Two RBIs for McGuire. Van Slyke charging hard. And his throw and sweep tag by Santiago, not in time to get Puckett. But Puckett came very close to missing third base as he rounded the bag. Still just one out. Lavin has surrendered four straight hits. And the sixth batter of the first inning is Cal Ripken Jr. of the Baltimore Orioles. Ball high for ball one. Tom Glavin says he's been working to solve the first inning problems. He goes out to the bullpen in recent days a bit earlier than he used to, and he allows himself a bit more time in the dugout and clubhouse before he goes out to the mound. That's down the right field line. Win on the run. He can't get it. 
He cut it off to prevent it from getting to the wall. Carter has scored. McGuire to third. The throw to second, and he's out. Great throw from the corner by the gold glover, Tony Gwynn. What a terrific play by Tony Gwynn. He cut it off and then throws an in-between hop to Ozzie Smith, and the sure-handed Smith makes a terrific play on the other end. Boy, that is a great play by Gwynn and Smith. Look at that pickup and the tag, actually Ripken sliding into the tag made by Ozzie. Now Ken Grippy Jr. He looked at strike one. So five straight hits now for the American League. Ripken thrown out trying to stretch his to a double. 17 gold gloves between that tandem of Gwynn and Smith. Five for Tony and 12 for Ozzie Smith. McGuire third with two outs. Three runs on five hits in the first for the American League. Sinking fast, a base hit. McGuire trots home, and it's 4 nothing. And the National League fans here in San Diego are growing a bit restless with Tom Glavin as Ken Griffey Jr. drives in the fourth run with the sixth consecutive single. And all-star hitters are not very concerned with scouting reports normally. However, all of, pitches, all of Glavin's pitches have been away. There have been five hits hit to center field and one to the opposite field by Cal Ripken Jr. So evidently the American League hitters coming out expecting the ball away, getting the ball away, and hitting it properly and not trying to pull it. Griffey Jr. at first with two outs. Lavin retired the first batter of the game routinely. Roberto Alomar went out on the ground ball to second. Box, Puckett, Carter, McGuire, Ripken, and Griffey have singled consecutively, and here's the eighth batter of the inning. Cleveland catcher Sandy Alomar Jr. It's the first time in All-Star Game history that there have been six consecutive hits. Wow. And in the bullpen, Greg Maddox of the Chicago Cubs is warming up. High and tight. One and one on Sandy Alomar Jr., the third consecutive junior to bat for the American League, following Cal Ripken Jr. and Ken Griffey Jr., the American League in this case. That's why they Truly call it the junior circuit. That's why they call it the junior circuit, right? In the hole, base hit off the glove of Ozzie Smith. Seven straight singles. Griffey Jr. to second on the play. So much for the problems in the twilight, although, you, as you noted at the outset, there is cloudiness overhead, and that is definitely helping the hitter. Yeah, there's no uh, problem because you don't have the shadows that are normally there between the pitcher's mound and home plate when the starting time is like this. The ball just off the glove of Ozzie Smith. Wow, seven straight hits. Hmm. It's the first time there have ever been seven hits in an inning, consecutive or otherwise. A lot of wow so far. Mm -hmm. Nowhere I had to get So the pitcher Kevin Brown unexpectedly gets to bat. Yeah, that's why Joe took Before he has ever thrown an all-star pitch. I wonder if this will help or hurt Kevin Brown as he prepares to go out to the mound in the bottom of the inning. Are you kidding? With four run cushion? <laughs> <laughs> However, pitcher. comma. He Pitcher. probably didn't expect to hit. Pitchers love to hit in the first mm -hmm. inning. One and two the count. Four nothing American League. We're still in the top of the first. First and second and two outs and Brown strikes out in a nightmarish first inning comes to an end for Tom Glavin. Ozzie Smith, Tony Gwynn, and Barry Bonds will get the National League started when we come back to San Diego, Jack Murphy Stadium.
All-Star Game from San Diego is brought to you by Toyota, reminding you to always buckle up. Do it for those who love you. Pinnacle by Score, serious cards for a serious game. And by Budweiser, the king of beers with that clean, crisp, cold taste. Nothing beats a bun. Here at San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium, the American League with four runs on a record seven hits in the first inning off Tom Glavin. And that cushion is handed to Kevin Brown of the Texas Rangers, the first Ranger pitcher ever to start an All-Star game. Kevin with a devastating sinker. As a matter of fact, he throws about two and a half ground balls for every fly ball that he throws. The only pitcher in the major leagues with a better ratio of ground balls is Bill Swift. Bill, of course, the pitcher for the San Francisco Giants, but look for a lot of ground balls off Kevin Brown. Ozzie Smith leads off. And Brown's first ever All-Star pitch is a strike. Brown's 27 years old from McIntyre, Georgia. City of Atlanta should be proud tonight. Tommy Glavin representing Atlanta and Kevin Brown attended Georgia Tech University down in Big A. You have to empathize with Tom Glavin. He said last year he was such a nervous wreck he really didn't stop to enjoy the game until it was too late. This year he said he was going to be much more relaxed and enjoy it but he could not have enjoyed that first inning. One and two on the Wizard of Oz. And that's fouled off the mask of Sandy Alomar Jr. You mentioned Georgia Tech. Kevin Brown, believe it or not, was a walk-on at Georgia Tech. Not only was he not drafted or even scouted by any major league team while he was at Wilkinson County High School, about 100 miles outside of Atlanta, he wasn't even recruited by a college baseball program. And he starts with a strikeout of Ozzie Smith. A borderline pitch on the outside corner, and Doug Harvey of the National League rings up Smith. Now, Mr. Padre. Tony Gwynn said, other than playing in the World Series for San Diego in 1984, this All Star game in his hometown would be his next biggest thrill. Last All-Star game here in San Diego back in 1978. Win in the air in left center. Kirby Puckett playing left field tonight makes the catch on the edge of the warning track. Two down in the bottom of the first. The American League with a 4-0 lead. It's been unusually humid here in Southern California in recent days. The locals complaining about the heat. Now Barry Bonds. About the only thing they can complain about in this area. And even then, they can't complain about the humidity very often. Jack McDowell of the Chicago White Sox is warming in the American League bullpen. In the air again to left. Kirby Puckett makes the catch. Four runs in the first inning ties an all-star game record done three other times. The American League comes up again, leading four to nothing. Four nothing American League after one. Let's listen into more of Tom Kelly's comments before the game. Boys, let's have some fun today and everybody be ready to play the first inning. We don't want to lose the game in the first inning. Let's win the game in the first inning. We can do that. All right, let's have a good day. Hmm. He's a prophet. He is indeed. <laughs> Tom Glavin delivers the first pitch of the second low. Roberto Alomar leads off for the second straight inning. He started the ball game by bouncing to second. He starts the second with a looping base hit in a right center. In defense of Tom Glavin, very few of these base hits have been rockets. But the fact is, eight hits are now on the board for the American League. And everybody has said this is a great area for young people. It's a great singles area, and this game proves it. Eight singles in one-plus innings. Hey, 
Now Wade Boggs, who had the first of the seven consecutive singles last inning, and he scored the game's first run. pitcher in all-star game history has ever allowed eight hits in an all-star game As a matter of fact the last man to yield seven was Tommy Bridges of the Tigers way back in 1937 Alomar leads away from first Boggs, that's well hit to left and Bonds makes the catch right along the line they ruled in foul territory and he had to contend with the bullpen mound as well. Fine play by Barry Bonds and there's that mound with which Bonds had to contend as Sean said tripping over the mound and he has the wherewithal to turn and throw the ball to second base. I think uh, bullpen mound should be out of the playing field in Major League Baseball. Is that baseball that is a very dangerous area. And when a fast runner is running as hard as Bonds was, it could cause a serious injury and almost did. Kirby Puckett, the batter, one strike the count. He singled to center and scored in the first. The American League batting in the second with a 4 0 lead. Alomar with a great jump, and the high throw goes into center field. Alomar remains at second. It's a stolen base, and now you hear some boos for Benito Santiago. The big question here in San Diego the last couple of days was would he be booed or cheered during the introductions because he has been being booed regularly at home. Alomar with 53 stolen bases last year, 18 this year, and Santiago's throw is high. As a matter of fact, Santiago has led the National League in errors four of the last five years. That was no error, however, given on that. But you saw the throws from his knees. As a matter of fact, Sandy Alomar Jr. used to be a teammate and an organization mate of Santiago. Both throw from their knees. <laughs> Makes you think you've done something wrong if you threw standing up. The ball blowing inside the bucket. Two and one on Kirby. it was nice that during the introductions there were many more cheers than boos for Benito Santiago. Mm -hmm. Alomar at second with one out. We're in the second. Four nothing American League. Two and two the count on Kirby Puckett. Puckett, one of 13 potential free agents at the end of the season, who was playing in the All Star game tonight. Yeah. Foul tip into the mid of Santiago for strike three. That's the second out of the inning and the second strikeout of the night for Tom Glavin. Joe Carter. He singled and scored in the first. I mentioned Glavin's difficulty in the first inning. In 19 starts for the Braves this year, he has surrendered 19 first inning runs. He gets through that. Usually he's okay. He's pitched five shutouts. One Blue Jay trying to push across another Blue Jay. And if Roberto Alomar scores, it'll be the first time he's been home in a while. He stays at the Sky Dome, the Toronto Blue Jays' home up in Toronto. 
stays in a room up there. He's running on the pitch. It's a strike, and he steals third without a throw. So Alomar has stolen second and third. Those are pretty nice rooms in that Sky Dome Hotel. Yeah, but see how badly he wants to go home? <laughs> Two straight stolen bases. He's trying to do it on his own. He has a home in Del Mar, California. He has a home in Clearwater, Florida, but rarely gets to go home. That's a strike, and it's two and two on Carter, who did not agree with the call from home plate umpire Doug Harvey, who at age 62 is working his final All-Star game. Doug Harvey, one of the great umpires over the last 31 years, San Diego native, announced yesterday he's retiring after this season. Carter with a little looper and a base hit. And Alomar does indeed come home. And a Toronto Blue Jay has driven in a run for the first time in all-star competition. Joe Carter two for two. Driving in his teammate. That's five runs on nine hits now for the American League. And it might mark the end of the night for Tommy Glavin as Bobby Cox is on his way to the mound. And Greg Maddox of Chicago will be the new pitcher. Greg Maddox of the Chicago Cubs, the new pitcher for the National League. He brings to the ball game a record of 10 and 8. Over 19 starts for Chicago. He inherits a 5-0 deficit. As Tom Glavin, the starter, surrendered five earned runs on nine hits, all of them single. Mark McGuire up for the second time. That's bounced off his foot, a foul ball. Here's what Bobby Cox had to say to his starting pitcher when Glavin came out of the game. Tommy, I've never seen so many balls fall in in my whole life. Unbelievable. Huh? Gee, yeah. Off the end of the bat. That's what the goal priest right there. Yeah. Hang with him, big guy. Well, that's a, a way for a manager to soothe his pitcher's nerves. Or a few bleeders mixed in, that is for sure. Terry Pendleton throws McGuire out, and that ends the inning. One more for the American League in the second. After an inning and a half in beautiful San Diego, it's 5 nothing for the American League. Delegates approve the Clinton Gore center of the road Democratic Party platform trying to move the party closer to voters around the malls in America's suburbs. Also, Jerry Brown tones down his fight with the Clinton camp fading or at least smoothed over. Dan Rather at the Democratic Convention in New York. More later. Now, back to the All-Star game. Thank you, Dan. Nice to see Dan caught up in the spirit of the evening. And you saw in the box Joe Carter catch the fly ball on the warning track it came off the bat of San Diego's Fred McGriff Fred just missing this fastball from Jack McDowell Fred, of course with a big hand and last year's MVP yeah. Terry Pendleton facing the new American League pitcher Jack McDowell Pendleton voted in by the fans with his 296 average and it's only fitting that Jack McDowell should be the second pitcher of the night for the American League the leading winner in the AL started Kevin Brown with 14 wins McDowell second on that list with 12. Dan rather talking about Jackson swinging hard there was another Jackson that swung hard in the old timers game yesterday Reggie Jackson with a grand slam home run off Bob Gibson he really has been to this point an American League dominated all star a couple of days in San Diego they won the heroes game they won the home run derby and they're leading this one five to nothing in the second Roberto Alomar to Mark McGuire Pendleton is out and that's five in a row to start the ball game for American League pitchers as Kevin Brown worked a one two three first from time to time in the background you might be able to hear the players being introduced over the public address system. Each player is being introduced on tape by his home stadium public address announcer. So if some of the voices sound familiar to you in the background around the country, they should. Jack McDowell's first pitch to Andy Van Slyke, a ball.
And ball two. Quite a few of the players for both leagues brought their children to the games. A.J. Van Slyk out at the game yesterday, along with Justin Sandberg, both eight years old. And they each had interesting things to say that we'll share with you as the night goes along. They did indeed. McDowell <laughs> in with a strike on 3-0. and oh, It's 3-1. and one. Kevin Brown, the starter, was from Georgia Tech. Jack McDowell, a product of Stanford. One of two Stanford Cardinal members on the American League pitching staff, Mike Messina of the Baltimore Orioles, the other. Three and two now on Vance Light. Two outs and the bases are empty in the bottom of the second. Five nothing American League. And Vance Light stays alive at three and two. If he can keep the inning going, he'll be followed by Ryan Sandberg. It is a very quiet pro National League crowd at the moment. Ben Griffey Jr. drifts toward left. And for the second straight inning, the National League goes in order. After two at San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium, 5 0 American League. Five nothing American League as the junior circuit comes up for the third time at San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium Cal Ripken Jr. drove in a run with a single down the right field line in the first he was thrown out trying to stretch it to a double all nine American League hits have been singles Greg Maddox of Chicago the pitcher strike one on Ripken this does not count as a continuation of Ripken's lengthy consecutive game streak, which stands at 1,660. Barry Bonds waiting for the high fly to come down. One out. Ken Griffey Jr. Ken Griffey Jr. He had the sixth of the seven consecutive singles in the first inning, and he drove in a run. Ken Griffey Jr., the leading vote getter for the 1991 All Star game among American League players. He's ahead in the count, 2-0. And, oh. and three years ago, he became the ninth All-Star player under the age of 21. And the American League with another win this year, Yvonne Rodriguez of Texas. He is 20. Griffey, 23 years old, and he's been in three straight All-Star games. That's well hit to left. Bonds on the run, looking up, and it is gone. That's why. A line drive opposite field home run for Ken Griffey Jr. It's six nothing American League. That is the tenth AL hit, the first extra base hit. And the first home run ever by a Seattle Mariner. How proud they must be up Seattle away, a sinker away. This ball has drilled the left field. Two RBIs now for Ken Griffey Jr. He is two for two. And perhaps an early leader in the most valuable player sweepstakes. Sandy Alomar Jr. single yeah, his first boy. time up. One and one the count. Make that 0 and 2 the count on the Cleveland catcher. Out of play and right, still 0-2. Normal speed, Ken Griffey Jr. right here. Three straight All-Star game. Yeah. 
We know we have base cam. I didn't know we had Mike Bat. That sounded like <laughs> the microphone was either in the bat or on the ball or in the catcher's mitt, but it was certainly close by. Mike Bat cam. And, you know, speaking of Mike, Greg Maddox's brother, Mike, left Greg his locker. So Greg Maddox is changing at the locker of his brother. His brother, Mike Maddox, a pitcher, right handed pitcher, same as Greg. And uh, Mike, a pitcher for the San Diego mm -hmm. Padres. Mike Maddox, one of the few San Diego players who didn't have to clean out his locker. He said he was willing to let his brother Greg use it as long as he promised to leave it clean when he left. Mm -hmm. Reasonable. The one two. Slapped down to first, a tricky hop, but McGriff stayed with it. He flips to Maddox for the out. Two down in the third. The bases are empty. The American League leads six to nothing. The pitcher Jack McDowell is due. There will be a pinch hitter. Edgar Martinez of Seattle is striding to the plate. Tom Kelly telling us before the game that he will probably, and the way Tom explained it, he said in a perfect world, I'll have Brown go an inning, and then McDowell an inning, and then Juan Guzman an inning, Roger Clemens an inning. And if anybody on the American League staff goes more than one inning early, it will be Mike Messina. Mm -hmm. Martinez swung at his first ever All-Star pitch and bounced to second. That ends the inning. Another run for the American League. On the home run by Ken Griffey Jr. of Seattle. And after two and a half, it's 6 nothing American League. And we'll return to the 63rd All-Star Game after this message and a word from your local station. Back in beautiful San Diego, the American League has scored in every inning. And it's 6 nothing as we go to the bottom of the third. Ryan Sandberg leads off. He was the leading vote getter this year among all National League players. Facing the new American League pitcher Juan Guzman of Toronto. Who crossed up Sandy Alomar Jr. with his first pitch. They're trying to get straight on the signs right now. Guzman making his first ever All-Star appearance. He's 25 years old from the Dominican Republic. Ball in for a strike, one and one. This is uh, like a North American All Star game. Six players from Puerto Rico, two from the Dominican, one from Panama, one from Nicaragua, and one from Canada. Straight back in our direction. There are more foreign born players in this game than any other in quite a while. 11 foreign born players as Tim mentioned and that is the second highest all star total in history Sandberg strikes out for the first out of the inning. Well what is in a number we mentioned that Justin Sandberg was with Ryan in yesterday's workout and this is what transpired between Justin Sandberg and me. <laughs> Benito Santiago fouls the first pitch straight back. We apologize that we did not have the audio for the conversation in the clubhouse, and we'll hear other comments from Justin Sandberg in a moment. Benito Santiago making what he expects will be his final All-Star Game appearance in a San Diego uniform. He's asked to be traded. He can be a free agent at the end of the year. He's behind in the count here 0-2. The National League is still looking for its first base runner with one out in the third. Pulled down the line, foul past Jimmy Williams of the Atlanta Braves, serving as the third base coach. Santiago on the disabled list for six weeks. And the one thing, if you're a free agent or on the last year of your contract, you want to have a good year. You want to leave in good graces because obviously if that happens, your value goes up. 
John mentioned earlier, 13 eligible for free agency next year. Santiago, one of them, and Mark McGuire, another. Wade Boggs, Cal Ripken Jr., Kirby Puckett. Barry Bonds, Ruben Sierra, it is a lengthy list. And a quality list. Guzman on the inside corner for strike three. Now we talked about uh, the Ryan Sandberg and the bringing of his child Justin yesterday, and here's what happened. What does that 23 stand for? Um, Michael Jordan's number and my dad's number, and then a lot of other um, famous baseball players. What's uh, what's your favorite baseball player's name? Ryan Sandberg. Why is that? Because he's my dad. He's his favorite baseball player, but when he had to list his favorite 23s, Michael Jordan, the typical Chicago kid is Justin Sandberg, mentioned Michael Jordan first. <laughs> Larry Walker of the Montreal Expos is the batter, another of the foreign-born players. We mentioned 11 of them in this game. Larry Walker is from British Columbia. The only other time there were more foreign-born players, 1968. A record 13 from outside the United States in the All-Star game that year. Guzman just misses. And the count is 2-1 and one on Larry Walker. Maybe the best player in this game that very few have heard of. Talking about numbers, Pat O'Brien informs me that Michael Jordan's son, Jeffrey, who is eight or nine years old, his favorite player is B.J. Armstrong with the Bulls. <laughs> Tough to have your son to have your number as, as his favorite. From deep third, Wade Bonds has to hurry. Safe as Walker. He's the first base runner for the National League. With two outs in the third and with the American League on top, six zip. A high chopper toward third now base. From the same and Wade Cardinals. Box has to wait Number for the in-between hop to settle. Side. And by the time he gets the ball to McGuire, Walker is safe. First hit for the National League. Mozzie Smith, the batter. That's to left. Bucket charging hard. Couldn't get it. Walker's on his way to third. He'll be held there. Ozzie Smith into second with a double. A slicing double to left. Kirby Puckett, of course, uh, most National League left fielders would play Ozzie Smith more shallow than Kirby. But one of the difficulties that outfielders have is where to play the hitters. They're not that familiar with them. But that ball missing the glove of Puckett and it hit his knee. Had it gotten through, Walker probably would have scored. Back-to-back so -back hits for the National League. Neither of them well struck. Here's Tony Gwynn, who was out on a fly ball to the left. His first time up. Gwynn, a four-time batting champion, eight times an All-Star now. He's won five gold gloves. And he's on his way to batting 300 or better for the ninth consecutive season. You can understand why they call him Mr. Padre here in the San Diego area. He's talking about the possibility of being traded within the next 10 days. He becomes a 10-5 player on July 19th. After that, he would have to approve a trade. 10-5, meaning 10 years in the major leagues, the last five with the same team. Padres having financial difficulties. Wynn thinks they might move him. Two and one the count. First threat of the night for the National League, and it's a pop-up drifting toward the stands. Boggs will not have a play. I think moving Tony Gwynn would be ill-advised by San Diego. I mean, the, if you have financial difficulties, the best thing to do is to win. And I think Tony Gwynn gives them the best chance to win. 
Padres in third place. They just swept the Phillies. Why in the world would they even think about trading Tony Gwynn? It's an excellent question. Except as Padre management noted in the paper this week, they think they're going to lose between eight and nine million dollars this year. Gwynn next year starts into a three-year contract extension worth twelve million dollars. You'd get some of that back in postseason play. Mm -hmm. Three-two pitch. In on the hands and fouled away. I doubt very strongly that the Padres would trade him. There would be a major uprising in the San Diego community if Tony Gwynn was sent packing. Larry Walker, the runner at third for the National League. Ozzie Smith at second. Two out, six nothing American League in the third. Chance for the National League to get back in it. And Gwynn is battling Guzman tough. Guzman knows that Gwynn is a very tough man to put away. Tony whiffed twice in the ball game on Sunday here against the Phillies. Just the second time since 1989 that Gwynn has fanned twice in the same game. That's ball four in the dirt. What a play by Sandy Alomar Jr. to prevent a run from scoring. That ball bouncing out in front of home plate and a fine block by Alomar. So now the bases are full for the man many believe is the best all-around player in Major League Baseball today, Barry Bonds, and another look at the block by Alomar. The balls that bounce behind home plate, not that difficult. That ball hit the edge of the plate and a very, very difficult block, but a good one by Alomar. Now Bonds, who fly to left his first time up. Another ball in the dirt and another good block by Sandy Alomar. We talked about that yellow light that should be flashing in a catcher's glove. You fall behind Barry Bonds in this situation, and that's when that caution light should be flashing. Another nice block by Alomar. Barry Bonds with a chance for a grand slam home run. There's only been one in all-star history. That 1983, Fred Lynn hit it. Tim, you caught a couple of balls in the game. How difficult is it for the catchers to adjust to the stuff of the different hurlers that they're unfamiliar with? I think it's very difficult. I mean, we came out and saw Juan Guzman uh, crossing up Alomar on the first pitch. Very, very difficult on the catchers catching the different pitchers. The 1-0. Fastball popped up. Boggs drifts over, checks the stands, and makes the play. The National League leaves them loaded and disappoints the folks here in San Diego in the process. After three, six nothing American League. If you're just joining us, the American League scored tw four times in the first inning off Tom Glavin with a record seven hits, and they came in a row, all of them singles. A single run in the second inning, the first RBI in an All-Star game for Toronto Blue Jays. Joe Carter knocked in Roberto Alomar. And the first extra base hit for the American League was the solo home run off the bat of Ken Griffey Jr. It came off Chicago's Greg Maddox in the third. The National League left the bases loaded in the bottom of the third, so it's still 6-0 American League. And the new pitcher for the Nationals is David Cohn of the New York Mets. David Cohn, the only representative of the Mets. The New York Yankees with only one representative. The Los Angeles Dodgers with one. And the California Angels with one. The Cleveland Indians alone have three representatives. And the Dodgers in uh, New York City have three. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of representatives from the major markets in this game. Roberto Alomar fouled the first pitch of the inning away. Let's check in with Jim Cott. Visiting with starting National League pitcher Tommy Glavin. Tommy, not the ideal conditions we wanted to visit under, but it was like they were having the closest to the pin contest. They didn't really hit any rockets. No, they hit a uh, few pitching wood shots off me, uh, a couple of broken back hits. But... I don't know what you can do about it. Just try to make your pitches and they, you know, they fall in the wrong places. No, nothing you can do. Now, how do you handle this with your psyche looking ahead to your next? Is this something to say, hey, I came to the All-Star game. I'm going up to sit with Wayne Gretzky, my hero. Turn the page and let's go. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, you come in here and obviously you try and do well, but uh, things didn't go that well for me tonight. But uh, I've had a good season thus far, and that's the reason I'm here. I don't have to prove anything here in this game. So just try and forget about this and, and pick up Saturday in Houston and go on my way. Well, you got that right. He doesn't have anything to prove. Last year's Cy Young Award winner on his way to another one. Back up to Sean and Tim. 
Thank you, Jim. You heard the reference to Wayne Gretzky, Tom Glavin, a former draft pick of the Los Angeles Kings, the fourth round pick back in the mid 80s. And he says he still fantasizes from time to time about skating with the great one. Here's another great one, Wade Boggs. Admittedly distracted this year by an ongoing contract situation with the Red Sox. He turned down a two year deal worth $9 million. Owen watched Boggs followed off his body in the box. Owen, two. Boggs has been up twice previously. He singled and scored in the first. He lined to left in the second. Very difficult in the major leagues to negotiate a contract and a pitcher as you look at number 24 left of your screen, Willie Mays. Bill White, the National League president, to his left and your right. Boggs called out on strikes. He's now one for three. Bill White has never won this game as the National League president. He is 0 and 3 and retiring after this year, so this is the last chance for them to win one for him, as you heard Bobby Cox tell his charges before the game. Bill and Willie teammates in the late 50s with the San Francisco Giants. Kirby Puckett, the bat. One strike to count. Kirby has singled and scored, and he struck out in the second. You'll get differing responses when you ask people around an All-Star game about the importance of winning, but not from the two league presidents. That was Dr. Bobby Brown of the American League you just saw. When I asked Bobby Brown yesterday, how important is it for your league to win? He said, it's the only thing. That's the only reason why we are here. Down to third to Terry Pendleton. And Cohn works a one, two, three inning. After three and a half, the American League six and the National League nothing. Honey up on the floor laughing like this. <laughs> Laugh with Howie Wednesday. Add some steam to your hot summer. Three American League pitchers have each worked a shutout inning, and the fourth pitcher in as many innings for the American League is Roger Clemens, the rocket of the Boston Red Sox. Roger, 9-6 and six at 2.31, and he has won three Cy Young Awards. He has had tenderness with the ball of his right foot. He has been rather ineffective lately pitching for the Red Sox. That foot problem has also caused arm strain. Carlos Bayerga of Cleveland into play second base for the American League. Roberto Alomar is out of the ball game. From the San Diego Padres. Robin Ventura of the White Sox replaces Wade Boggs at third. And Brady Anderson of the Baltimore Orioles is the new AL left fielder with his 90210 sideburns. <laughs> and here's Fred McGriff. He flied to right against Jack McDowell in the second. Rich Clemens first pitch through the middle. A base hit for Fred McGriff. Fred McGriff out of the Tampa area. We asked his mother for her memories of Fred as a youngster. We would be getting ourselves ready to go to Sunday school. And this particular morning, guess what Freddie was doing? Freddie was back there shining his baseball cleats. And I says, Freddie, I says, it's time for Sunday school and you shining baseball cleats. As far as he was concerned, the Sunday school shoes were fine as they were, but those baseball cleats had to be shined. <laughs> well, Fred can uh, play Major League Baseball and shined cleats now, as his mom called them. Cleats, of course, for football, spikes mm. for baseball. Fred doesn't have to worry about uh, shining his baseball no. cleats anymore. No, indeed. No. One of the nice things about <laughs> being a big leaguer, a great selection by the fans across Major League Baseball was Fred McGriff. For the first time, he made it to the All-Star Game, and he is a most deserving recipient, as is the man at the plate here for the first time, Terry Pendleton of the Braves. McGriff was the only man to have hit 30 or more home runs in each of the last four years and he was very disappointed when he was not selected last year to go back to Toronto where he started his major league career. This is the first time in the ball game that the National League has had the lead man on. Pendleton looks at strike two one and two 
on Terry Pendleton, Andy Van Slyke to follow. Roger Clemens himself wearing a special shoe as a result of that foot problem. He has a reinforced toe area in his right shoe. A lot of strain as he drives off the mound. Base hit for Terry Pendleton. The National Leaguers left the bases loaded last inning. Now they have two men on. With nobody out in the fourth, they're down six to nothing. Outfielder from the Pittsburgh Pirates, number 18, Andy Van Slyke. And here is Andy Van Slyke, who was out on the fly ball to center his first time up. National League with the right guy up there, Andy Van Slyke leads the majors in hitting against right-handed pitchers. 376 average. Top swing at a strike. His batting average with runners on base is also the best in the majors. He's hitting 371 this year with men aboard. Slider low, and it's one and one on Van Slyke. Van Slyke, a low ball hitter, a sweep hitter. You can almost see by the way he gets ready how much of a sweep hitter he is. That is the type of pitch that he usually hammers, but of course you're not facing Roger Clemens when that pitch is in the strike zone. A little bit more giddy up on mm -hmm. him. Clemens said yesterday he feels 100% now. He was pleased that the Red Sox went into the break on a bit of an upbeat note, winning their last three to get within 10 games of first place Toronto in the AL East. Double play ball by Erga to Ripken to McGuire. Four, six, three, two outs, and a runner at third now for the National League in the bottom of the fourth. Jimmy Williams says hello to Fred McGriff. What do you think he just said? Hello, I'm Jimmy Williams of the Atlanta Braves. That's his old manager, Jimmy Williams, the former manager with the Toronto Blue Jays. When he was traded to the Toronto Blue Jays by the New York Yankees, George Steinbrenner would later call it the worst trade in Yankee franchise history. And you can't disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Certainly among them. Brian Sandberg, a weak ground ball to Bayerga. Once again, the National League threatens, but they fail to score in the fourth. After four in San Diego, it's six nothing American League. CBS Sports presents the 63rd All-Star Game from San Diego, brought to you by the people at Nike who encourage you to just do it. Old Milwaukee and Old Milwaukee Light. And by Toyota, reminding you to always buckle up. Do it for those who love you. The Democratic Convention update live from New York's Madison Square Garden. Jesse Jackson hit one out of the park here tonight with his Keep Hope Alive speech. The rhetoric was old line Democratic Party, but Jackson backed the new generation ticket. He called Bill Clinton President Clinton. He called Al Gore tested and prepared. Also tonight, some hominy and some harmony. Jimmy Carter addressing the delegates and Jerry Brown turning down the volume on his fight with the Clinton camp. Also this evening, assembled delegates here approved a center-of-the-road Democratic Party platform to help the Clinton-Gore ticket go shopping for votes in the fall in America's malls and suburbs. Dan Rather at the Democratic Convention in New York. More later, now back to the All-Star Game in San Diego. The new pitcher for the National League is Bob Tewksbury. He steps into the spotlight with his team trailing 6 to nothing. An all new battery, Tewksbury of the Cardinals on the mound. Darren Dalton of the Philadelphia Phillies is the catcher. And down at the hot corner, hometown favorite, Gary Sheffield of the San Diego Padres. Joe Carter, the hitter. He's working on a perfect night. Tewksbury's first pitch of ball. Carter singled and scored in the first. He singled to drive in a run. 
in the second. If you're just joining us, that's the first RBI ever by a Toronto Blue Jay in all-star play. It has been rare this season for Bob Tewksbury to go two balls and no strikes on anybody. He's walked nine and 134 and two-thirds innings. Ryan Sandberg calling for a fair catch in this, the home of the San Diego Chargers as well. One out in the fifth. The pictures you are seeing from the air are being provided tonight by the Bud One Airship, which is piloted by Tony Stevenson. A beautiful night for Tony to be up there. Mark McGuire takes an off-speed pitch from Tewksbury for a strike. He singled to drive in two runs in the first. He also scored in that inning. He faced Greg Maddox in the second and grounded out. Tewksbury's a native New Englander. He's from Concord, New Hampshire, making his first all-star appearance. Routine pop-up. Again, it's Sandberg, two down. And all of a sudden, National League pitchers, Maddox, Cohn, and Tewksbury have combined to retire seven in a row. Cal Ripken Jr. singled to right, drove in a run in the first. He was thrown out, trying to stretch that to a double. He fly to left in the third. Tim Hill yeah. his consecutive games played streak of 1,660 into the second half of the Oriole campaign. And you realize how many games that he has played consecutively in pain. Lou Gehrig, 2,130 games in a row. If Ripken breaks his streak or ties it, it will be sometime in June of 1995. Speaking of pain, uh -huh. it's fouled off his foot. It is particularly impressive when you consider that the second longest current game streak in Major League Baseball is 139 by Carlos Baerga of the Cleveland Indians, a fellow All-Star, Brett Butler. At his snap to 235 for the Dodgers over the weekend. And Joe Carter earlier in the year at 242 before he set out. But Cal Ripken has not set out since 1983. Actually, 82. That's a foul ball. Battery taking no chances. And it is not a foul ball, it's an out. Ripken claiming the ball came up and brushed him off the arm, and it certainly looked like it did from here. Doug Harvey thinks he was just trying to buy a call, and that ends the inning. Well, let's see if it came up and hit the shirt sleeve of Cal Ripken. It looks like mm -hmm. it may have. Definitely yep. changed directions. Doug Harvey didn't see it, so Ripken's the third out. One, two, three. Go the American Leaguers. All-star of all-stars, Willie Mays, played in 24 of these. I know it's tough, but you remember, what's your fondest one? Well, I, I think in Cleveland, uh, that was one of my uh, fondest because I got hurt in uh, Philadelphia, and I wasn't supposed to play at all. I won the most favorite player. Uh, I think that was one of my fondest, uh, you know, of all the, the games I played. How about 1960 when they still played two games? You went six for eight in a week, right? But I didn't want to play because we had to go coast to coast. And, <laughs> but that was for the pension plan, so it was a good, it was good for everybody. The hero of so many of today's players, even American League manager Tom Kelly, the most electrifying player perhaps in the history of baseball, Willie Mays. Back to Sean and Tim. Thank you, Jim. New pitcher on the mound for the American League is Mike Messina of the Baltimore Orioles, and he's working to Darren Dalton. There are a couple of other changes for the American League. Travis Fryman, the 23-year-old shortstop from the Tigers, is into the ball game, and Ruben Sierra of Texas is in right. Darren Dalton up for the first time at age 30 after a brutal car accident in midseason last year and five knee operations on his left knee here he is in his first all-star game and he was the deserving starter at catcher in the National League but not selected as such by the fan that's a very high pop up Carlos Bayerga 
One out in the National League fifth. It's six nothing in favor of the American League. Darren Dalton, a guy who has probably worked off the field as hard as he has on the field. He's a weightlifter, and I think pound for pound, the strongest man in baseball right there. He told me he works out six days a week, three hours a day on the weights of the offseason. The hand is for Gary Sheffield. And that's why they're applauding. The 325 average and a league leading 62 runs batted in. It would be interesting to know what the reaction of living rooms in Wisconsin was as Gary Sheffield strolled to the plate. He is a former Milwaukee Brewer, and it was a miserable experience for him. So coming to San Diego and being fully healthy is the reason why he has completely turned his career around. It's tough to admire some of the things he did in Milwaukee. He admitted that from time to time, when his desire to be traded, he would intentionally throw balls away. So it was not only a miserable experience for him, but Milwaukee shared in that. Milwaukee and his teammates and his manager, Tom Treblehorn, is now coach with the Chicago Cubs. He's out on the fly ball to Brady Anderson and left. Two down in the fifth. Six nothing American League. If you're just joining us, the AL scored four times in the first on seven consecutive singles. They added a run in the second, an RBI single by Joe Carter, and Ken Griffey Jr.'s home run in the third. Made it six zip. Ozzie Smith up for the third time. Facing Mike Messina in his second year in the major leagues in his first All Star game. Like Jack McDowell, who preceded him on the American League mound, he is a graduate of Stanford and he needed only three and a half years to get through one of the most difficult universities in the country. So he could pitch and tell you how he does it, too. Mm -hmm. His degree was in economics, which would serve an all-star in this day and age very well. Absolutely. Mike's just 23 years old. From the home of Little League Baseball, he was born in Williamsport, PA. He still lives in Pennsylvania. Two and one the count. Smith swinging away on three and one, and he fouled it out of play. Mentioned Mike Messina, only 23, and Ozzie Smith, 37, the oldest shortstop in baseball. Interestingly, the shortstop position, the youngest position in baseball. It has been for 12 straight years. Here's a 23-year-old shortstop, Fryman, to throw out Ozzie Smith, and one, two, three, go the National Leaguers in the fifth. We'll return to the 63rd All-Star Game after this message and a word from your local station. Sean McDonough with Tim McCarver, Jim Todd, and Pat O'Brien. It's great to have you with us for the 63rd annual All-Star Game and an All-Star tradition that took place yesterday. The signing of the bats and balls by the All-Stars assembled. They have to sign 60 dozen baseballs each, and you can see they have to cross their names off the list as they go by. That's that a is lot of signing. 720 baseballs are signed by the All-Stars and then distributed primarily back to the All-Stars. And it uh, obviously is one of the more cherished mementos from All-Star play. Just one change as we go to the top of the sixth. Tony Fernandez of the Padres, the new National League shortstop. It's 6-0 for the American League. Ken Griffey Jr., leading candidate for the game's most valuable player award. He singled a drive and a run in the first. He hit the only home run of this game to this point in the third. And if you remember Tom Kelly's remarks before the game, he said, uh, Ken, you might have a little trouble with this guy. Talking about Tom Clavin. Well, he's two for two, and the home run coming off Greg Maddox. And, of course, kiddingly, uh, talking about how the lineup would do and how well they would do in the first inning, and they did. He's taking another step toward the MVP award as he pulled one down into the right field corner. And now he's lacking just the triple to hit for the cycle tonight. 
A single, a home run, and now a double for Ken Griffey Jr. of the Seattle Mariners. With his home run earlier in the ball game, the Griffiths, Ken Griffey Sr. and Jr., are the first father and son duo to have each homered in an all-star game. Ken Griffey Sr.'s was in the 1980 game at Los Angeles off Tommy John. Andy Alomar Jr. fouled the first pitch away for strike one. The single was in the first inning for Alomar. It was the seventh of the seven consecutive singles. Good piece of hitting there. He got the ball to the right side. Get the runner to third. Ken Griffey Jr. at third with one out, and here's Jim Cott. Well, Sean and Tim, you know the Padres could have some alumni game here. Joe Carter and Roberto Alomar coming back. What was it like coming back to San Diego for you? I tell you, it was very satisfying and gratifying for me to, to have played here for two for one year in 1990 and to come back here and play an All-Star game. I mean, my first two All-Star games in Toronto and San Diego. Uh, you have to talk a lot to the media, but my kids enjoyed it, and I, I started my first game uh, hitting fourth and. Oh, I was in heaven today. I had a really great time out there. What about the times talking to your former teammates that you maybe haven't seen for a while? Well, I didn't have that much time to talk to all of them. I would have been there all day with so many of them, but I got a chance to spend a little, a little time with Bip, a uh, little, little bit, a lot of time with Tony Gwynn, because uh, my kids stayed over his house, uh, you know, the last couple of nights. But, uh, I mean, it's great for the Padres uh, to host the All-Star game and have so many players involved. Joe Carter, an All-Star wherever he goes. Back to Sean and Tim. Thank you, and while the gentlemen were chatting, Brady Anderson in his first ever All-Star at bat bounced to the first baseman McGriff unassisted, and Griffey Jr. is still at third now with two down. We're in the sixth. It's 6 nothing in favor of the American League. And here's Carlos Baerga. Tuned up for the All-Star game by hitting 500 in the week leading up to the All-Star break. Carlos, a switch hitter. And it was his dad, Jose, in his native Puerto Rico, who taught him to be a switch hitter when he was eight years old. Carlos said his father told him then, become a switch hitter, that's your best bet to get to the major leagues, and if you really work hard at it, someday you'll be an all-star. And Carlos said when he called his father to tell him he had been selected the all-star team, his father cried on the phone. Jose Bayerga, Carlos's dad, is here tonight. Carlos took a while to get the news. He was in Texas with the Indians and out shopping for a Mercedes with Felix Fermin, who had $950,000 a year as the highest paid of the Cleveland Indians. And they went off to Fort Worth. It was the trainer of the Indians, Justin Warfield, son of Jim Warfield, who told Bayerga, and Carlos didn't believe him. He went running into the clubhouse to find out if it was correct. Not only was it correct, but now he's driven in a run in an all-star game. With a gapper to left center, Griffey has scored. It's a double for Carlos Bayerga. You have to think Jose might be either smiling or crying again. And if you keep driving in runs, you can keep driving Mercedes, too. <laughs> <laughs> A fastball away from Tewksbury, rifle to left center field. There. Boy, I'll tell you, hitters' eyes light up when they see fastballs up around the letters. And you could see those eyes lighting up. Raman Ventura up for the first time. So it's 7-0. Seven, seven runs on 12 hits now for the American League. Two doubles in the inning. The leadoff double by Griffey Jr. And the two-out double by Bayerga. That's the first run surrendered by Tewksbury in his inning in two-thirds. Breaking ball just missed. Tewksbury was a logical candidate to be the starting pitcher for the National League in this one. He leads the league in earned run average, 1.87. I asked Bob the other day if he was disappointed not to be selected the starter. He said, no, I would go to the All-Star game and just shag balls behind second base or help clean up the dugout. <laughs> I'm just happy to be there. He's a great story. He's battled back from a couple of Operations to his pitching arm, one to his elbow, one to his shoulder. Fair ball off the glove of McGriff. Bayerga is coming around to score. It's eight to nothing, and Ventura has the third American League double of the inning. 
The throw got away as it came back into the infield, and Sheffield had to track it down near the left field line. And Robin Ventura with that flat bat swing of his lines one off the glove, a one hopper off the glove of Fred McGriff. So Ventura with the double to drive in a run. 13 hits now for the American League. They started with nine singles. Then a home run for the 10th hit. Now three consecutive doubles. They're due for a triple. Here's Ruben Sierra. Up for the first time tonight. And he looks at strike one. It was a tough call in the outfield among two Texas Rangers for Tom Kelly Juan Gonzalez certainly deserving of all-star recognition but Sierra the veteran player got the call over his youthful teammate well they should expand the rosters 28 players on the rosters too few that's well hit to right win to the wall home run Ruben Sierra A two run homer and it's 10 to nothing. That's the second home run of the night for the American League and their 14th hit. Bobby Cox is probably sitting there saying it's tough enough to hit with two hands. What about hitting it that far with one hand. Watch this. It was 390 with one hand. Probably 780 with two. <laughs> we saw yesterday in the home run derby the ball was really flying out of this ballpark and you felt like if the hitters had a chance to see in the twilight that if it wasn't particularly bright they'd have a chance to hit tonight and at least on the American League side they have. <laughs> Travis Fryman. The lone Detroit Tiger representative, and that created a stir as Cecil Fielder, the major league leader in runs batted in, was omitted, but that should not be any slight directed at Travis Fryman because he is certainly a deserving all-star himself. And at age 23, he is still the youngest member of the Detroit Tiger. And Fryman walks on four pitches. So things are coming apart for Bob Tewksbury here in the sixth. He worked a one, two, three, fifth. But he's allowed three doubles, a home run, and a walk now. And here comes Bobby Cox out to get him. John Smoltz of the Atlanta Braves will be the new pitcher when we return to the 63rd annual All-Star Game. The new pitcher for the Atlanta Braves is, or for the National League rather, is John Smoltz of the Atlanta Braves for the 10 and 6 record. Part of that outstanding starting staff. And he is greeted by a pinch hitter. Paul Molitor of the Milwaukee Brewers is coming up to bat for Mark McGuire. So McGuire's night ends at 1 for 3 with a two run single in the first. He also scored a run. Molitor takes a strike of the knees. Talk about a well kept secret. A 303 lifetime batting average, 158 home runs, 396 stolen bases. What a career he has had. And that has him in very elite company. Mm -hmm. He and Willie Mays are the only players in Major League history with a 300 career average, 150 home runs, and 300 steals. Another wow. Mm. Because he plays in a small media market, I'm not sure fans around the country appreciate what a consistently fine player Paul Molitor has been, and again this year at age 35. Member of his fifth All Star team, Molitor pops it up. McGriff to the rail, does not have a play. We're in the sixth inning, four runs across in this frame for the American League. 
They also scored four times in the first single runs in the second and third. It is ten to nothing. Ruben Sierra telling Robin Ventura who was aboard about his home run. That's well hit and sinking fast and right. It falls in front of Gwynn. Fryman stops at second. Out at second. Gwynn threw in behind him. Fernandez tagged him out. Diego Jack Murphy Stadium, Pat O'Brien over in a place where we usually aren't in the bullpen uh, with Dennis Eckersley and uh, with this kind of lead, not too much pressure on you tonight, huh? It's nice to be able to talk to you again to nothing, that's for sure. How does this bullpen rate uh, versus other bullpens around the league? You like them open, don't you? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot a lot worse bullpens, but, uh, you know, you like a bullpen where you feel like you're in part of the game. There's some bullpens where you come out from left field or center field and uh, you don't even know where you are when you get through the gate. So it's nice to be able to get a feel for the game. Hope to see you in the game tonight. Shooting the uh, bull with the X. Back to you guys. Nice <laughs> I'm glad he said that. From the San Diego Padres, <laughs> right fielder, number 19. New pitcher for the American League. The sixth pitcher in its many innings for the junior circuit, Mark Langston, the lone representative from the California Angels. And Mark Langston quite candid, saying that Jim Abbott should have been the one selected instead of him his third all-star game working at Tony Gwynn the pitch caught by the new catcher for the American League 20 year old Yvonne Pudge Rodriguez of the Texas Rangers the first of many all-star appearances for him Travis Fryman after the embarrassment of getting nailed on the bases throws to Paul Molitor a high throw and perhaps Travis is still thinking about the base running blunder a moment ago Now Barry Bonds of the Pittsburgh Pirates. He's 0 for 2 tonight. Big breaking ball. Roberto Kelly of the Yankees has come in to play center field. So all of the American League starters are out of the ball game now. Langston candid about it. But he felt Jim Abbott should have been the selection. Jim Abbott only 4 and 11, but with an ERA of under 3, and he's been the victim of absolutely no run support. Paul Molitor victimized by a bad bounce. Bonds is going to try for second, down 10 to nothing, and he's in there safely. The first extra base hit of the ball game for the National League. Mm. Ow. Victimized, I think, the appropriate word there, Sean. From the San Diego Padres. Just missing the coconut of Paul Molitor. So Bonds is aboard with the fifth National League hit of the night. And here is Fred McGriff. Was one for two. He singled off Roger Clemens in the fourth. Mike Messina worked one perfect inning for the American League. Langston watched McGriff duck out of the way from the breaking ball. What a miserable year it has been for the California Angels. Both on and off the field. On the field with their cellar dweller status. And off the field with the car crash that has knocked their manager out of action at least until mid-August now is when they tell us Buck Rogers might be back. That's well hit. And in for a hit. Here comes Bonds to the plate. Anderson throws to the middle of the diamond and the National League is on the board. Fred McGriff delights the Padre faithful. They've been waiting for something to cheer for and now they have it. One of their own has knocked in the first senior circuit run of the night. And the second hit of the ball game for Fred McGriff. Looked like a fastball away. And McGriff with good power the other way. 
is a much better hitter against left-handed pitching this year, by the way, batting 379 against left-handers this year. Speaking of good hitters against left-handed pitching. Will Clark batting for the pitcher Smoltz. 318, Will's average. He has started at the last four All-Star games at first base and was leading through most of the All-Star balloting this year, but was overtaken at the wire by Fred McGriff, who edged him by 16,000 votes. Will Clark. Classy statement said the fans made the right choice. Fred McGriff deserved to be the starter this year in the National League. It's interesting that these two earned a lot of respect for each other during the brawl that the Giants had with the Padres earlier this season. McGriff was really hot and charged out to the mound, and it was Clark who grabbed him and pulled him away, a member of the other team with whom the Padres were brawling. And Will Clark, in trying to restrain McGriff, said, Fred, you're too good a player. Your team is going to need you for the rest of the season, no matter how mad you are. Don't do this. It was really the beginning of what is a nice developing friendship for these two. They have always respected one another. Trevor Wilson, the left-hander for the Giants, was the pitcher that night. Both he and Fred McGriff were given four-day suspensions by National League President Bill White. McGriff hurt his shoulder, and so did Clark. Clark slices it down the left field line. Long run for Anderson. It's a foul ball. Just foul in the American League bullpen. Ten one American League. We're in the bottom of the sixth. The National League has scored its only run of the night here in the sixth. And they have a runner at first with one out. Clark thought it was outside. Doug Harvey's had a generous strike zone tonight. That looked to be a pretty good pitch from our vantage point. And it's the second out of the inning. First strikeout for Langston. He was telling Ron Gant, the next hitter, that it was up. It wasn't up. It could have been outside. Oh, we'll take a look. Yep, looked a little outside. Doug Harvey, usually a guy who makes you, from a width standpoint, who makes you throw a strike. That ball appeared to be a little outside. And Doug Harvey, we mentioned earlier, at age 62, working his sixth and final All-Star game after 31 years as an umpire, he's hanging it up, and he was making the notation of Ron Gant, who's up to bat for Andy Van Slyke. Gant, a member of the Atlanta Braves, making his first All-Star appearance. And this was very important to Ron Gant. I was talking to Willie Mays before the game and in the National League clubhouse, and he was talking to Ron Gant, trying to get him to relax his left forearm while awaiting for the pitch. Then that uh, just instead of gripping the bat intently, there's Willie right there. Instead of gripping the bat intently, just relax the hands, and that in turn relax the forearms. That's a lot of arm to relax. <laughs> felt up until this point that he was not getting his due as one of the best all around players in baseball. He's twice a 30 30 man with 30 home runs and 30 stolen bases in the same year. An all star for the first time tonight. And ahead in the count. Three balls and one strike. The American League leads 10 to 1 in the bottom of the sixth. Fouled straight back, three and two. Only two other players have had back to back 30 30 seasons, and they are Willie Mays and Bobby Bonds. Amazing how Willie Mays' name keeps coming up when you talk yeah. about some of the extraordinary feats in the history of the game. He was the best player I ever saw. Pulled down the line. It's going to be a long throw for the gold lover Ventura. And he got the speedy Gant by a running step. 
The National League is on the board after six. It's a nine run lead for the American League. Dennis Martinez of the Montreal Expo is the new pitcher for the National League as we go to the seventh with the National League down ten to one. Will Clark remains in the game. He's the new first baseman. Craig Vigio of the Houston Astros at second base. And it's an all new outfield. Vip Roberts of Cincinnati in left. Ron Gant of the Atlanta Braves in center. And John Cruck of the Philadelphia Phillies is in right. And Roberto Kelly is the batter. He's coming up for the first time tonight. Kelly, the lone representative of the New York Yankees in this All-Star game. And he swings and misses the first pitch from Dennis Martinez. Kelly, the first Panamanian-born player to play in the All-Star game since Ben Ogilvie in 1982. Dennis Martinez, a native Nicaraguan, making his third All-Star game appearance. He now makes his home in Miami. He's and a father he, of four children, and, has a couple of them along. And is he ever a hero in his home country? Perfect game last what year against the that? Dodgers. And a perfect at bat with Roberto Kelly. He struck him out on three pitches. Let's check in with Jim Cobb. All right, Sean, here with American League first baseman Mark McGuire. What fun. Had to come out like this with the double digit runs. It's one of the better games I've played in as far as All Star. Yeah. Well, you've played in a lot of good ones in the first half. Now, now tell me, you're keeping your hitting tips. To, you're keeping them secret, but looks like you have a very relaxed right elbow. Does that have something to do with your swing? Yeah, I got to keep it inside. And then sometimes I like. Uh, Hit my uh, forearms together, sort of like uh, what Joe Morgan did when he played with the Reds, and it just tells myself to keep my arm inside so it doesn't flare up. If I flare up, sometimes I tend to get long, so it's just something I've uh, done over the past uh, spring training, and it, it, it's worked. You know, you Oakland A's are keeping pace with the Minnesota Twins with guys that nobody's ever heard of, like Troy Neal, and uh, it's miraculous. I think that's why we're going to sit pretty right now. I think we're going to get our big boys back uh, right after the break here. And and I think we'll be tough to tough for the Minnesota Twins and we play them six more times, so it's going to be a good road, uh, road down the down the. Ugh, this is terrible. It's easy to say. In the easy spot, there. The big boy has been back. Yeah. The big boy has been back for the first half of the season. Back upstairs. And perhaps Mark McGuire was rattled by the trip around the base pass of Pudge Rodriguez. He had a shot to the wall and right. Truck couldn't catch it, but then the youngest All Star at age 20 was thrown out trying to stretch it to a triple. John Crook can't track it down. Ball hits the heel of the glove. He is awarded, however, a double. And the relay throw to Gary Sheffield nails the diving Rodriguez. Rodriguez, the youngest All-Star at age 20 years, 7 months, and 14 days. He is the first player ever born in the decade of the 1970s to appear in an All-Star game. That's kind of frightening. Even I feel old. <laughs> Here's Chuck Knobloch, another first-time All-Star, and this is second year in the Major Leagues. Come on, Eddie. Two and all on Knobloch, hope American you, League Rookie of the Year last year. Hope you're able to say that a long time. Even I feel old. That's something that's <laughs> nice to say for a long time. And Yvonne, as you said earlier, We'll continue to say that he is some talent. Well, there have been five players who ever appeared in an All-Star game at a younger age than Pudge Rodriguez, Dwight Gooden, Butch Weiniger, Jerry Walker, L.K. Line, and Johnny Bench, the only younger All-Stars. Pudge said his goals this year were to hit 300 and be an All-Star, and he might accomplish both of them this year. Knobloch walks. Craig Vigio. Converted. He was, a, as a matter of fact, he was a catcher in the All Star game last year in Toronto. And uh, catching comes in handy as far as accuracy and throws are concerned. Vigio, now a second baseman. 
Only one of two players who have played 100 games behind the plate and 100 games as a catcher. Craig Biggio, not only an all-star catcher, but an all-star second baseman, too, with a fine throw to Gary Sheffield. The only all-star ah! to have been an all-star at both of those positions. That's an incredible transition, as you know, in one year to do it. Brady Anderson, the batter. Pete Rose, an all-star at five different positions, all three outfield positions, first and third, but certainly ah! a catcher. It was unlikely for Biggio to be here because of that transition. It was certainly unlikely at the start of this year that Brady Anderson would be here. Coming into the season, Anderson had a career batting average of 219. And he also owned the dubious distinction of being the only outfielder in the history of Major League Baseball to hit 231 or less in each of his first four seasons in the majors with a minimum of 60 games played in the outfield. Like Sampson, he grew his hair longer and got stronger. I see a lot more of those 90210 sideburns, That's, I think, around got that right. Major League Baseball. Brady. It is a fad in the Baltimore area now to have all the teenagers growing their sideburns mm -hmm. <laughs> longer. That's a ball low. Brady says he doesn't think it's the sideburns, but he is going to leave them at that length. And he doesn't like the comparison to 90210, actually. He said it has nothing to do with that television program. Fernandez steps on the bag. He didn't need to throw to first. Seventh inning stretch, 10-1 in favor of the American League. CBS Sports presents the 63rd All-Star Game from San Diego, brought to you by Oldsmobile, the power of intelligent engineering, the people at Nike who encourage you to just do it, and by Columbia Pictures, a league of their own, America's favorite summer movie. Dan, the first pitch at the bottom of the seventh from new pitcher Cleveland's Charles Nagy it is a strike to Craig Biggio. Biggio up for the first time. It's 10-1 in favor of the American League. Biggio and that foul ball bounce up. It looked like it hit him around the base, but he's okay. Must be this guy's fault. What did you do to the scoreboard? Huh? What did you do to the scoreboard? Why is it 10 to Darren one? Dalton waits on deck. One of the reasons they converted Biggio to second base, the biggest reason is to take advantage of his speed. Average 22 stolen bases a year as a catcher. He already has 19 this year, and he walks back to the bench as a strikeout victim of Charles Nagy. Let's check in with Jim Cott. 10 to 1 American League. In fact, Roger Clemens, the Rockets, so relaxed. He said, you look like you're dressed for jogging. Where, where did you catch you on your way to? I just got down nice, and I was going to do a little exercising, but after that shot, uh, we, we just got a close look at that SWAT team. I don't know if I'm going to go out and run <laughs> no, or not. Do that. Hey, tell us that you're going to run now, so your toe must be okay. You had a little problems with that earlier this year. Sure did, and uh, it's feeling really uh, good now, so I'm uh, excited about it and excited to get back and uh, hopefully have a good second half. Yeah, and the Red Sox have played pretty good baseball coming up to the break, so you got to be a bit optimistic. Well, even though you've got a long way to go. We, we are, and uh, getting Third down to 10 foot. games was uh, 10. You know, a pretty nice Gary feeling for the ball club. So we'll see what happens. We're going to have to go to a pretty good clip the second half to catch uh, Toronto and Baltimore. All right, have a good run. Have some fun out there. Get back for the finish of the game back upstairs. Speaking of running, Charles Nagy has become an avid runner because his wife, Jackie, is herself a runner and a fitness buff. Gary Sheffield. Got out of the way of the pitch and did check his swing. They appealed down first, and Rich Garcia said it was not a swing. These fans can't be happy, Tim. Most of them National League rooters, but they're enjoying a gorgeous Southern California night. Well, a beautiful uh, night, a beautiful stadium. This stadium has housed the Chicken, Mick Jagger, Simon and Garfunkel, Roseanne Barr, Steve Garvey. Rather eclectic, I would think. The Super Bowl it was expanded in the mid-80s. 
up to its capacity of 60,000. A name for a great man, a former sports writer and sports editor here in San Diego, Jack Murphy, who's the brother of New York Mets longtime broadcaster Bob Murphy. Two and two on Sheffield. He's up with two outs and the base is empty. While Jim was visiting with Roger Clemens, Darren Dalton bounced to first. Whoa. I don't know if you flinched at home, but I did here in the booth as that one came right back to the camera. I'll let you know when to flinch. <laughs> you have a little more experience with those balls coming in that direction. Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> Yankees pitch. Bounced to short. Travis Fryman throws him out. One, two, three. Goes the National League. The sun is setting on San Diego, and it is setting on the senior circuit. They're down by nine as we go to the eighth. He is sponsored by Budweiser. It has been All-American League from the outset. Seven base hits, all of them singles for four runs off Tom Glavin in the first inning. Joe Carter singled in Roberto Alomar, the first RBI in an All-Star game ever by a Blue Jay. Ken Griffey Jr. hit the first home run of the ball game, a solo shot in the third to make it 6 nothing. A four-run sixth, highlighted by Ruben Sierra's two-run homer. The Finally, the Indians. National League got on the, the board pitcher, when Fred Nagy. McGriff singled in Barry Bonds. Doug Jones of the Astros, the new pitcher, ah! and he's facing Charles Nagy. Nagy has to bat because Tom Kelly has achieved one of his objectives in getting all 18 position players into the ballgame. No position players left on the bench. Nagy might have a hit. He does. I mentioned he can run with help from his wife. <laughs> <laughs> An American League pitcher getting a base hit. I remember Tim Stoddard, the last American League pitcher to get a hit in the World Series. Third baseman, so Charles Nagy. That is the first hit by an all by a, an, an American League pitcher in an All-Star game since Ken McBride. Now this was 11 years before the designated hitter came into into being. Wow. That was in 1962. Robin Ventura sinks one in the center, a base hit. Saw Nagy switch helmets, so even though he's a pitcher, he has a <laughs> batting helmet, now a running helmet. That might be the first batting helmet he's ever worn on any base. He did fly down the line, oh, though, didn't he? Mm -hmm. huh? Work with his wife, Jackie, has been paying off. Yeah. Seventeen hits now for the American League. That ties the all-star game record for most hits by one team. The AL had 17 hits back in 1954. Ruben Sierra one for one with his two-run homer in the sixth. A couple of weeks ago, we did a game in Chicago. I was hanging around the Texas clubhouse and stumbled upon Ruben Sierra doing an imitation of Nolan Ryan. It was very humorous, and with some prodding yesterday, we got Ruben to do it for us. Look at the right shoulder. And the lean to the right. Yeah, lean to the right. Get the ball. <laughs> a double play ball if they hurry. But the throw from Biggio was a little tough for Fernandez to handle. They erase Ventura. Nagy to third on the play. First and third and one out. Sierra safe on the fielder's choice. We're in the eighth. It's 10-1 American League. From the Detroit Tigers, shortstop, Now Travis Fryman, who walked in his first ever All-Star plate appearance. Strike one. That is the change off the change that Doug Jones has become so famous for. 128 saves, the all-time Cleveland Indians save leader. He has 19 this year, and there was another one. He reminds me a lot. Uh, you older folks out there remember Stu Miller with the head jerk 
and one change up after another. You have a tendency to swing at that arm motion. What a great story he mm -hmm. is, too. Signing a AAA contract this spring with Tucson. And he has gone on to be one of the saviors in the Houston bullpen. He never did earn, never did see any playing time in the minor leagues for Houston. He signed a AAA contract, but earned his right to start the season with the Astros in spring training. Base hit. Fryman is perfect. Maggie scores. It's 11 to 1. The throw to third is cut off. Sierra to third. So Fryman has walked and now single to drive in a run in his first All Star game. Bobby Cox has watched the American League pile up a record now 18 hits. Three in this inning. Paul Molitor, the fifth batter of the inning. He came up as a pinch hitter for Mark McGuire in the sixth and singled off John Smoltz. Chopped foul. Sporting new colors and a new name, the Goodyear Blimp Eagle from Carson, California, has been providing these aerial pictures. Tonight, the pilot is Joel Chamberlain. Molitor frozen by the 0-2 pitch, and he's gone on three pitches. Two outs now in the eighth. It's 11-1 in favor of the American League. That's the first strikeout for Doug Jones. And the American League on their way to winning five in a row from the National League. That has never been done. They have won four in a row one other time. Back in the late 40s. Of course, the National League's longest winning streak, 11 games. In All-Star history, there's been a lot of trends back and forth. Roberto Kelly up there with one ball to count. That's well hit, fair ball. Down into the corner and into the bullpen. Sierra has scored. Fryman is being waved around. He scores. It's a two-run double for Roberto Kelly of the New York Yankees. That is the 100th hit in all-star competition by a member of the New York Yankees. They have more than any other major league team. A changeup, and it's drilled past Mike Sharperson. And it plates, too, rattling around in the bullpen past Lee Smith. As you can see it hopping up as Sierra scores, Fryman scores, 13 to 1, and the route continues. Mm. Hides Rodriguez swinging for the fences. Why not? <laughs> Hudge just a little bit older than those fellows you just saw. <laughs> with Jim Sundberg yesterday for so many years an outstanding major league catcher he played in the Heroes game and he's a broadcaster for the Rangers and he says Hudge Rodriguez has the finest skills of any young catcher he has ever seen I think uh, what just uh, looking at him what could develop is he's only 20 years old he's very thick through the waist he's thick through the thighs he's thick through the chest he could have a weight problem as he gets a little older. But you can see uh, how he is put together. He's put together about like most catchers are. Jones stumbled as he delivered the pitch. He's got a lot of change-ups, but that was not in his repertoire. Slip pitch. <laughs> This is the 2-2 pick. Yes, sir. And he struck him out. Three more for the American League. 13 runs on 19 hits in San Diego for the AL. 
And welcome back to San Diego, Jack Murphy Stadium. The American leads, American League leads 13 to 1. And normally about this time, we talk to the president of the United States. But, Faye Vincent, you've been in the headlines more than the president, I think. Uh, first of all, they'll probably figure out a way to blame this on you, huh, the score? Well, I don't think so. It's been a nice game. A little lopsided, that's all. It's fun for you to be at the ballpark and away from all the controversy. Well, that's right. It's always fun to be at the ballpark. This is a lovely ballpark, and we've had a lot of... Uh, good moments here in the last few days You're a ballpark kind of guy too aren't you well i hope so it's the right place to be in my position what about the reports that's swirling around now about this alleged fax with uh, we've heard as many as 20 22 it's written uh, owner signing it to to ask you to resign uh, how are you handling that well i, I think we should just ignore it today uh, this is a day for baseball and a great game and i really don't think we need to deal with it how long can this bickering go on, and is the bickering good for baseball? Well, I don't know that it's bickering. Uh, we have to come together, all of us, in baseball, and I hope we will, to see if we can't deal with the ser serious problem. I think one of the other things in this game in particular is a lot of the players who weren't here. Is there any uh, consensus around baseball of maybe changing the selection process? Your Cecil Fielders don't get in. I mean, there's always a complaint about somebody. Well, there are a lot of very good first basemen in the leagues these these days. Uh, now, I haven't heard any talk, and I, I was in the dugouts, and... Uh, I didn't hear much about it. If indeed there is, I'm going to badger you one more time on this. If, if indeed there is this alleged fax, would you consider resigning? Under what circumstances would you resign? They can't fire you. Well, I, I don't think that's a subject. I don't intend to resign. I don't think the issue is going to come up. And I think we will come together and deal with our problems. You think that's going to happen? Yes. You like being badgered in your own box? <laughs> I'm, happy to, I'm happy to be badgered. <laughs> I'm used to it. Hope you're enjoying the night. How many hot dogs tonight? Just one. Just one. I thought this was a three-dog night for you anyway. Commissioner, always a pleasure. Nice. Thanks, Pat. Back to you guys. Faye is okay. And you get diverse opinions. I think the thing I admire most about Faye Vincent, he is certainly not reluctant to make the difficult decision. It is a very difficult job when you're dealing with 26 and soon to be 28 owners and their egos, which are large. And you're not going to please everybody most of the time because there are diverse interests among baseball's ownership. He has put his foot down when he's felt it has been in the best interest of baseball. Whether you agree with the individual decisions or not is one thing, but he deserves credit for making it. Truck with the base hit. How many decisions, uh, I think you have to ask yourself, how many decisions has he made that are wrong? As far as the, base, the best interest of baseball are concerned. The most recent, the realignment, the Chicago Cubs and the St. Louis Cardinals going to the Western Division next year, along with the Colorado Rockies, when expansion occurs. And then the Cincinnati Reds and the Atlanta Braves going to the East. That should have been done, it seems to me, 23 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's long overdue. I would agree. The only mistake he's made in recent days, and he admitted it, was when he summoned Buck Showalter, Gene Michael, and Jack Lawn of the New York Yankees to his office a couple of hours before an afternoon game to talk about their testimony in the Steve Howe drug hearing. There is Buck Showalter. And he apologized mm -hmm. for that publicly. But other than that, as you point out, clearly realignment is in the best interest of baseball. And in this case, it's the Chicago Cubs looking out for their own best interests, but right. somewhat selfishly since it is in many ways not in the best interest of the overall game. Nip Roberts the batter. Base hit. So a couple of former Padres are on. They're facing Jeff Montgomery of the Kansas City Royals here in the bottom of the eighth with the American League leading 13 to 1. There is Montgomery. It was pretty well acknowledged that Kevin Apier a starter with 10 wins for Kansas City would have been their selection, but he worked on Sunday for Hal McRae and therefore would not have been available in this game. Useless to bring him to San Diego. He's unable to work. So Montgomery, who is their closer and is, was, was worthy of consideration, is on the mound. Not only worthy of consideration, but Tom Kelly says that he deserves to be on the mm -hmm. team. Again, an example for a, an expanded roster. Pip Roberts, after the base hit, asked for the ball. It's his first all-star hit. He got the hit, and Rich Garcia got him the ball. Tom Pagnazzi with the pop-up and shallow right. It's handled by Ruben Sierra.
Now Will Clark. He was called out on strikes in the sixth. And there's going to be a pitching change here. Rick Aguilera of the Minnesota Twins is coming into the ball game, and Jeff Montgomery departs. San Diego, 59,372 on hand at San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium to watch this rout of the National League by the American League. It's 13 to 1 for the AL, and the new pitcher is Rick Aguilera of the Minnesota Twins. On to face Will Clark. The first and second and two outs. Clark deep down the left field line. Anderson to the wall. It's a home run. Aguilera's first pitch taken out of the ballpark to the opposite field by Will Clark. It's 13 to 4 American League. The first three run home run hit by a National League player since Johnny Callison's three run homer in 1964, the first year of Shea Stadium. A three run shot by Will Clark. He had taken a fastball for strike three the last time up. And revenge in how sweet it is. I don't care what the score is. We obviously don't go as much by the numbers in the All Star game, particularly with the score the way it is. But Go by your own number. Had this been a, a game of meaning, Tom Kelly would have known that Clark had already homered twice in his career and only 14 at bats against Aguilera. So that is his third and 15 at bats against Aggie. Ron Gant, the batter, 3 0 the count. We did not have the twilight zone tonight here in San Diego, and the hitters are glad for it. Flashed foul and out of play, three and one. That's an example of uh, how managers treat a game like this. A 3-0 pitch, Ron Gant swinging. Uh, the National League nine runs behind. But uh, Bobby Cox, Ron Gant's manager, realizing he didn't come here to walk. He came here to hit. He wants to hit his way back to Atlanta. There's Roger Craig, manager of the Giants, one of Bobby Cox's coaches. Ventura in foul ground. He handles the pop up and that ends the inning. Three more for the National League on the three run homer by Will Clark. And we go to the ninth with the American League on top by nine. Thirteen to four as we go to the American League. As we go to the ninth inning, the American League on top. The American League coming to the plate with Chuck Knobloch to lead off against the 54th player to appear in the game. 54 out of the 56 have now appeared as Norm Charlton of Cincinnati missed low with ball one. Only Lee Smith and Dennis Eckersley are yet to get in the game and will undoubtedly see the Eck in the bottom of the ninth. Obviously the one sided nature of this game is enabled both managers to get everybody in but the fans have still gotten their money's worth <laughs> <laughs> why don't you ah! <laughs> <laughs> well we were thinking yesterday about the total salaries of both clubs and you will be interested to know how much both teams make this year with 13 players eligible for free agency as Clark makes a rather insignificant catch. The National League salary of all 28 players, $66,471,667. And the American League, $51,904,750. For a total of right around $118 million for the 56 players. And that is uh, just about enough to buy a Seattle Mariners franchise. That's about what it went for, right? <laughs> $125 million. Brady Anderson sends it straight back. 
Well, the question is, do you get anything for being here? I mean, we don't have to hold a benefit for these guys, but do they yeah. get a little bonus? Well, of course. Mm -hmm. But of course. We didn't figure that in. It was pocket change. <laughs> Some of them have bonuses in their contracts with their individual teams. Brian Gant drifting back in center to make the catch. Two outs. And another pitcher is coming up to bat before the dazed gathering here at San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium. They can't believe what they are seeing under the full moon. Another American League pitcher coming to the plate. We saw Brown in the first inning. Nagy got a base hit. And now here's Rick Aguilera. And you can tell by that swing that he is a hitter. He went to Brigham Young University as a third baseman. He changed to pitching his second year. As a matter of fact, last year during the World Series, he made the last out of the game for Tom Kelly's Twins in game three of the World Series. That was in the 12th inning, Atlanta scoring and winning their first game of the series in the bottom of the 12th. Strike of the knees. One ball and two strikes on Rick Aguilera with two outs and the base is empty at the top of the ninth. It's 13 to four in favor of the American League. Charlton trying to put a little extra on that one. He missed low two and two. Get right here. Come on. Foul tipped into the mitt to end the inning. We go to the bottom of the ninth. And the National League needs a touchdown and a field goal. <laughs> Friends, this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Despite the lopsided score, most of the folks are still here at San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium. Sean McDonough with Tim McCarver, Jim Cott, and Pat O'Brien. And it's Craig Biggio to face Rick Aguilera as we go to the bottom of the ninth. Aguilera is still in there, but Eckersley is still throwing in the American League pen. Vigio struck out against Charles Nagy of Cleveland. And he looks at a strike one and one. Aguilera came to the Minnesota Twins as a starting pitcher. He watches Vigio at a line drive to center handled by Roberto Kelly. The one out. Tom Kelly is on his way to the mound. We'll take this opportunity to tell you that some of tonight's aerial photos have been provided by Goodyear's newly painted and renamed Airship Eagle. Rick Aguilera has departed, and now every American League player has participated in this one as Dennis Eckersley takes the mound. You know what I think Tom Kelly's thinking is right here? Rather than bring him in at the start of an inning, give him more recognition by bringing him in with only one out because he is the premier reliever in baseball 34 consecutive saves without a blown save opportunity over two years 30 this year what a remarkable story the only pitcher ever to have a hundred saves and a hundred wins as a starter 34 saves over Two seasons, a major league record without blowing one. That scorecard's pretty neat compared to ours here in the booth. <laughs> the last time a team used every player in an All Star game, the National League, in 1987, and that was a 13 inning ball game. And what you could do is just cross out Aguilera right there. <laughs> so we did that for Tom. No reason for him to continue making notations no. on the scorecard. That's exactly right. And uh, Dennis Eckersley will be the 28th player 
for the hit. There is Aguilera right there. So we'll manage from the booth. We get accused of that anyway. There's Eckersley. <laughs> Eckersley, who has crossed off. So it is complete. All 28 players for the American League have been used up. You know, I often wondered what use the Telestrator had in baseball, and now I know it is a vital cog in any <laughs> baseball telecast. <laughs> Eck on in what is clearly not a safe situation. His team ahead 13 to 4 with one out of the bases empty in the bottom of the ninth. He will be greeted by Darren Dalton. Now batting from the Phillies, number 10, Darren Dalton. Good to see Darren Dalton in a Philadelphia Phillies uniform. Yesterday, both Dalton and John Crock had to participate in the workout in different uniforms because the Phillies, who were here in San Diego over the weekend, went back to Philadelphia for the All-Star break, and their equipment man took Crock and Dalton's warm-up jerseys and game jerseys. They had time to get the game jerseys back today via delivery service. But yesterday, Cruck came out <laughs> in the jersey of Leo Mazzoni, the Braves' pitching coach. Number 54. He and Mazzoni, and Mazzoni only live about 10 minutes apart right on the West Virginia border. As a matter of fact, they, they get together during the winter and barbecue, <laughs> of all things. That was the first thing Cruck wanted to know when he walked in the clubhouse yesterday. Where's the spread? Where's the lunchroom? Right. John went up to the concession area trying to find a Philly sweatshirt or t-shirt that he could wear and the lady at the concession stand said why would we sell any Phillies paraphernalia here <laughs> was a little put back by that Molitor to Eckersley safe Darren Dalton just did beat it we will see how it, that is going to be scored this ball hit like a bullet Molitor on the short hop with a skate save, we talked about Tommy Glavin and his affinity for hockey earlier. And by the time Molitor makes the play, Eckersley covering, it's too late. Looked like a base hit for mm -hmm. me. No word on the scoring yet. Earlier in the ball game for you Texas Ranger fans, now they have charged Molitor with an error. Hudge ah! Rodriguez doubled and was out trying to stretch it to a triple. Well, they just changed the scoring on that a while back. And they charge John Cruck with an error out in right field. No double for Rodriguez. Mike Sharperson of the Dodgers, the batter. And he's quickly behind in the count 0 and 2. And somebody in Orangeburg, South Carolina, is very, very pleased tonight. Mike Sharperson's mom and dad. His dad uh, was a gentleman who was in the slaughtering business. And Mike Sharperson, so, so happy to be in this game, selected as the only Dodger to perform for the National League. His dad, as you might have heard on the pregame, with Pat O'Brien, 71 years old, also named Mike Sharperson. Doesn't like to fly, so he did not make the trip out here from Orangeburg, South Carolina, but Sharperson has been recording the goings-on with a home video camera. Here's Tony Fernandez. The last man standing between the American League and their fifth consecutive victory in all-star competition. As a matter of fact, Mike Sharperson is getting a bat signed for his father. And even went to the American League bench yesterday afternoon to have the American League sign the bat also. So he'll have 56 prized autographs on that bat, and that's for Dad. 1-1. Slider for a strike, one and two. Nice for Mike's dad to watch his son have a little more air time in the dugout. That's right. Eckersley would love to close it with a punch out. That just missed. It's two and two. And that's low. It's three and two.
13 to 4. American League. Two outs and a runner at first in the bottom of the ninth. Fernandez pulls it foul. I invite you to stay tuned for our postgame coverage, including the naming of the most valuable player of this 1992 All-Star game. Jim Cott will speak with the winner. Three-two pitch. Sinking fast and right, that's a hit. So the National Leaguers cling to life as Fernandez singles with two outs, sending Dalton to second. John Crook. He singled in the eighth inning off Kansas City's Jeff Montgomery and scored on the home run by Will Clark. Nineteen hits for the American League, ten for the National League. I guess you thought with the count three and two that Dennis Eckersley was going to walk Tony Fernandez, right? Not a it, chance. No way. He has walked 36 batters in the last four years since 1988. Maybe the most remarkable control of anybody who's ever pitched mm -hmm. when you think about it. What a string he has put together. Brock just did get a piece of it. It's one and two. Eckersley this year has only walked five batters in 43 innings for the Athletics. Darren Dalton says it ain't over till the fat guy swings. And he was talking about John Crutch. He swung, but it's not over. He beat Eckersley to the bag. Dalton, the author of that statement, to third. <laughs> and two hits for the league's leading hitter. As a matter of fact, he leads the majors with that 346 average. Fine play by Chuck Knobloch. And a one-hopper to Eckersley. Two close plays at first base this inning. But the National League with the bases loaded and two outs. And Bip Roberts, who singled and scored on the Clark home run last inning. Well, the tying run is still in Encino, but the National League is trying to make it interesting. Norm Charlton is on deck. So if they're going to make a miracle comeback, it's going to require a hit from a pitcher because they don't have any position players on the National League bench. Only Lee Smith has failed to appear in this ball game for the NL. Just inside. Roberts up there with a count of two and one. It's 13 to four, but the bases are loaded for the National League with two outs in the bottom of the ninth. And there's Charlton waiting to hit in the on-deck circle. Two and two. One of many relief pitchers, Dennis Eckersley, says he would rather not pitch in these situations where the game is so one-sided, it's much more difficult to concentrate. Roberts battling tough. His pride's on the line a little bit right now, mm -hmm. though. Base is loaded. 2-2 two, two to Roberts. Line drive, base hit. Dalton has scored. Fernandez around to score, and it's 13 to 6. Vip Roberts is two for two. He might want the ball again. <laughs> 
Well, we talked about expanding the roster and it not being the most important thing on who wins and who loses. But uh, Norm Charlton ending an all-star game or batting to end an all-star game with two outs, kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Rem reminiscent of the 1981 All-Star Game after the strike when Dave Steve was the second hitter in the ninth inning. AL